and Sunday at 9. Now an oversight hearing on the operations of the Postal Service. Yesterday, a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee heard from Postmaster General Marvin Runyon and Michael Motley of the General Accounting Office. Congressman John McHugh of New York chairs the hearing. I always try to do on behalf of the entire subcommittee welcoming everyone here uh, this afternoon as we continue our general oversight hearing agenda. Uh, today's session is really a... Uh, uh, a holdover, a reschedule of an earlier uh, scheduled uh, hearing that was postponed uh, because of um, a personal situation with the Postmaster General, and we're delighted he's here in person and looking robust and well uh, with us today. Uh, our first panel, however, is uh, uh, made up of two individuals. We'll include Mr. Michael Motley, no stranger to this subcommittee, who is Associate Director of the Government Business Operations for the General Accounting Office. And he will be accompanied by the Assistant Director for Government Business Operations, Teresa Anderson. Over the past two years, GAO has proven to be a most productive partner to the subcommittee in reporting to us on a broad range of postal operations. I think it's important to note that the GAO has identified a number of initiatives where the Postal Service could undertake to improve its performance. I look forward to Mr. Motley today highlighting these initiatives, especially to the extent which the service has followed up on the questions raised by GAO in its past reports to Congress. Further, I understand GAO has a number of assignments pending. I hope Mr. Motley can report to us the status of these assignments and the impact these reports will have in assessing the productivity and efficiency of the Postal Service. Our second panel of witnesses today is, as I've indicated, Postmaster General Marvin Runyon, who will be joined by Deputy uh, PMG Michael Coughlin. Uh, the last two years have been a banner financial uh, period for the Postal Service. We have seen the Postal Service's ledger moved from deficit spending to reporting surpluses of almost uh, $43.5 billion since the end of 1994. Uh, gentlemen, if the past financial performance of the Postal Service is an indicator of future results, your management of postal operations will really stand as an example of how to best bring an organization around to sound business practices. Never in the 26th history Year history of the Postal Service have significant financial achievements of this magnitude uh, been obtained. But storm clouds do uh, appear on the horizon. I note for the record that a recent accounting report for the period 6, which is February 1st through February 28th, shows volumes and revenues less than projected. Recent news accounts speculate the Postal Service will seek a general rate increase sometime this summer and postal officials have publicly projected a revenue surplus of $55 million for this fiscal year, and that's a marked decrease from last year's $1.7 billion surplus. Press reports on the service, on other service activities have not been positive either. We have seen questions raised regarding last year's marketing department's budget overruns and questions of ethics, which have dogged postal officials and cast a shadow over postal operations. As chairman of the subcommittee over the past two years, I've seen the organization post a strong financial performance. But Congress and the American people demand accountability from all facets of this institution. And questions regarding these operations only provide fodder to opponents of postal reform who use these instances as excuses to erect roadblocks to passage of our reform agenda. While today's hearing is not specifically devoted to reform issues, I hope we will engage in a dialogue which further provides a positive record on which this subcommittee can proceed in improving postal service to this great country. To that end, our oversight efforts will continue to build a record in identifying necessary reforms in pursuit of ways to strengthen the one organization, the United States Postal Service, devoted and directed to performing the mission of providing affordable, universal mail service. Uh, with that, I uh, gratefully acknowledge uh, the arrival of the ranking member, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah. I'd be happy to uh, yield to him. Any comments he'd like to make at this time? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, have a prepared opening statement entered into the record and uh, thank you for convening this hearing. Uh, look forward to hearing the testimony from the Postmaster General in response to uh, a whole range of issues. Uh, one is that obviously there's been a lot of success uh, under the, um, the management that he has put in place and his team has put in place, but there are uh, areas of concern and we think that today's hearing is an appropriate place to both look at the, uh, the, uh, the successes and some of the issues that remain to be resolved. Uh, there are some uh, questions that uh, the public in this committee need to have answered uh, relative to uh, changes in uh, some of the procurement procedures, uh, issues relative to the overall financial performance uh, that I think that uh, the, obviously the Postmaster General is in the best position to answer. We look forward to his testimony. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman. I, I should say as great an admirer as I am of the Postal Service, we do want to keep accuracy somewhat in the ballpark here. And I said 43.5 43 billion in surpluses. Uh, that is uh, 3.4, I believe, is more correct. But we've, we've set the bar for you, Marvin. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, as I said, I thank the ranking member. Uh, and I also uh, am pleased we've been joined by uh, Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. LaTourette, I'd be happy to yield to him any comments he might wish to make at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like yourself and Mr. Fatah, I very much look forward to the testimony today from GAO and also the Postmaster. And in my part of the world, there are a number of questions, although we commend the, the Postal Service for the, uh, the, the uh, writing of the fiscal ship, there are a number of questions concerning the closure of small post offices and, and how we deal with that situation in the future, as well as uh, some questions about compensation packages that occurred during the course of the end of last year. Uh, but to move the hearing along, I would ask unanimous consent that my full opening remarks be included in the record of this proceeding. Without objection, so order. Without objection, all members uh, will have the opportunity to submit uh, opening statements for the record uh, in their entirety. Uh, he has not yet had a chance to settle in, but I'm uh, grateful that uh, Mr. Davis has, has uh, joined us here today. I'd happy to yield to him at this time if he'd like to make any opening comments. Well, I would indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to make a few remarks uh, as we begin these proceedings. I'd also like to express appreciation to those who are going to be giving us information. As I understand it, the United States Postal Service's net income for fiscal year 96 was $1.6 billion, which was the second most profitable year in its history. I certainly would acknowledge and commend all of those who contributed to this remarkable year from the Postmaster General and Inspector General to the frontline men and women postal employees. It is illustrative of the hard work that all of them have done. I'm interested in hearing today in sort of an information sharing process and would want to raise a couple of concerns. They're mostly based upon information that I pick up from people as I travel throughout the district where I live and work. I have some concerns relative to the alleged proposals to contract out services for the manufacturing of postal uniforms that may end up involving union shops. And while I'm not suggesting that we only look in a certain direction for certain kinds of activity, I do have some concerns about what I'm hearing that the possibilities might be. I also raise the concern and have some concerns about constituents of mine who are fearful that they may end up losing their jobs to substandard manufacturers if we go in certain kinds of directions. And I also have some concerns relative to the whole question of how we view affirmative action at the very highest level of the system. And, and so those are three major concerns that I have. And certainly appreciate the opportunity to lay those out and hopefully we will hear responses to them in the testimony as the day proceeds. Well, I thank the gentleman uh, both for his presence and his expression of concern with that. Uh, I would uh, welcome uh, Mr. Motley and Ms. Anderson to the front table.
Before we uh, under please be seated. I'm sorry. Before we uh, undertake the uh, committee rule of uh, swearing in uh, those who are about to testify, we've been joined by my fellow New Yorker, um, Mr. Owens. I'd be happy to yield to him. Any opening comments he might wish to make at this time? No, I have no opening statements. I thank the gentleman for joining us. Uh, if uh, now that you've sat, stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to uh, present will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that both of the witnesses answered the oath in the affirmative. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for being here. I, I noted uh, in my opening comments about the uh, relationship between the GAO and you as individuals and this subcommittee, we are very appreciative of the uh, very valuable uh, information and analyses you have provided us. A small sampling of that work is contained on the side <laughs> table near the, the entrance. If some folks would like to uh, pick any or all of those uh, uh, different differing documents up, I think they'll see very clearly uh, how GAO has been a very productive partner on this oversight function. So uh, we welcome you here as colleagues and as friends, and we're very interested in the comments that uh, you uh, have to share with us today. So Mr. Motley, I yield to you so that you may proceed as you uh, deem fit. And thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate those kind comments about the work we've done over the last several years. And uh, we, too, have uh, enjoyed the relationship that we've had not only with the subcommittee here, but with the Postal Service as well. Uh, while you uh, introduce Ms. Anderson, I'll mention that uh, Ms. Anderson is the focal point for our postal activities uh, within the Government Business Operations Issues area. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to state that uh, I'd like to summarize my statement today, but ask that it uh, be included in full in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. And Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we're pleased to be here today to participate in the subcommittee's oversight hearings on the U.S. Postal Service. My testimony will focus on the performance of the Postal Service and the need for improving internal controls and protecting revenue in an organization that takes in and spends billions of dollars each year. And I'd like to also highlight some of the key reform and oversight issues that continue to challenge the Postal Service and Congress as they consider how U.S. mail service will be provided in the future. I'll also provide some observations from our ongoing work. First, I would like to discuss both the reported successes and some of the remaining areas of concern related to the Postal Service's performance. Last year, the Postal Service reported that it had achieved outstanding financial and operational performance. Financially, the Postal Service had the second most profitable year in its history. According to the Postal Service, at its fiscal year 1996, net income was $1.6 billion. Additionally, the Postal Service continued to meet or exceed its goals for on-time delivery of overnight mail, with its last quarter of 1996 showing a delivery rate of overnight local residential mail uh, as 91 percent at on-time or better service. Also, in fiscal year 1996, the Postal Service mail volume exceeded 182 billion pieces and generated more than 56 billion in revenue. While these results are encouraging, other performance data suggest that some areas of concern warrant closer scrutiny. For example, last year's delivery of two- and three-day mail at 80 and 83 percent, respectively, did not score as high as overnight delivery. Such performance has raised a concern among some customers that Postal Service's emphasis on overnight delivery is at the expense of two- and three-day mail. Additionally, although its mail volume continues to grow, the Postal Service is concerned that customers increasingly are turning to its competitors or alternative communications methods. In 1996, mail volume increased about one-half of the service's anticipated increase in volume. Containing costs is another key challenge that we reported on previously. Labor costs, which include pay and benefits, continue to account for almost 80 percent of the Postal Service's operating expenses. And the Postal Service expects that its cost for compensation and benefits will grow more than 6 percent in 1997. Overall, the next five years, the Postal Service plans to devote more than $14 billion in capital investments to technology, infrastructure improvements, and customer service and revenue initiatives. The Postal Service continued success in both operational and financial performance will depend heavily on its ability to control operating costs, strengthen internal controls, and ensure the integrity of its services. 
However, we found several weaknesses in the Postal Service's internal controls that contributed to unnecessary increased costs. We reported on October 1996 that internal controls over express mail corporate accounts were weak and non-existent or non-existent, which resulted in the potential for abuse and increasing revenue losses over the past three fiscal years. Specifically, we found that some mailers obtained express mail services using invalid EMCAs and that the Postal Service did not collect the postage due. Consequently, in fiscal year 1995, the Postal Service lost express mail revenue of about $800,000 primarily because it did not verify EMCA accounts that were later determined to be invalid. Since our report was issued, the Postal Service has taken action or developed plans to address these deficiencies. Similarly, we reported in June 1996 that weaknesses in the Postal Service controls for accepting bulk mail prevented it from having reasonable assurance that all significant amounts of postage revenue due were received when mailers claimed pre-sort, pre-barcode discounts. We reported that during fiscal year 1994, as much as 40 percent of the required bulk mail verifications were not performed. Bulk mail totaled about one half of the Postal Service's total revenue of $47.7 billion in fiscal year 1994. At the same time, we found that less than 50 percent of the required follow-up verifications to determine the accuracy of the clerk's work were being performed by supervisors. Another area of recent concern has been the overall integrity of the Postal Service's acquisitions. We concluded in our January 1996 report that the Postal Service did not follow required procedures for seven real estate or equipment purchases. We estimated that these seven purchases resulted in the Postal Service's expanding, expending about $89 million on penalties, unusable or marginally usable property. Three of the seven purchases involved ethics violations arising from the contracting officer's failure to correct situations in which individuals had financial relationships with the Postal Service and with certain offers. We also pointed out that the Office of Government Ethics was reviewing the Postal Service's ethics program and reported that all areas of the program required improvement. The Office of Government Eth Ethics subsequently made a number of recommendations designed to ensure that improvement of the Postal Service's ethics programs continue through more consistent oversight and management support. Since our January 1996 report, the Office of Government Ethics has completed three reviews to follow up on its open recommendations. Recently, the Postal Service developed guidance for avoiding conflicts of interest in filing financial disclosure reports, as well as established procedures to ensure that the Office of Government mm -hmm. Ethics is notified about all conflict of interest violations that are referred to the Department of Justice. As a result of these actions, the Office of Government Ethics closed its remaining open recommendations. Recently, we issued a report that described how the Postal Service closes post offices and provides information on the number and provided information on the number of closed since 1970, over 3,900 post offices. In addition, yesterday we issued a letter to you, Mr. Chairman, about the emergency suspension of post offices, which states that about 470 post offices currently are in emergency suspension status. These 470 have been in this status anywhere from a few days to over 10 years. The second area I would like to discuss is the pending postal legislation. This legislation, if enacted, might place the Postal Service in a more competitive arena with its private sector counterparts and has raised some key reform issues for consideration. One such issue relates to proposed changes in the private express statutes. These statutes were set up to ensure that the Postal Service has enough revenue to provide universal service to postal services to the general public and that certain mails, such as first class, will bear a uniform rate. In our September 1996 report, we emphasized the importance of recognizing the statute's underlying purpose in determining how changes may affect universal mail service and uniform rates. Most important among the potential consequences is the relaxing of the statutes could open first class mail services to additional competition, thus possibly affecting postal revenues and rates and the Postal Service's ability to carry out its public service mandates. Mr. Chairman, as you are aware, we also have a number of ongoing reviews related to the postal reform. For example, in concert with your focus on the future role of the Postal Service, we are currently reviewing the role and structure of the Postal Service's Board of Governors in order to determine its strengths and weaknesses. Another issue important to postal reform that we are reviewing involves access to mailboxes. Congressional oversight remains a key a key to improving the organizational performance of the post office. 
Generally, the long-standing labor management problems we identified in 1994 still remain unresolved, despite the initiatives that have been established to address them. For example, the number of grievances requiring formal at arbitration has increased about 76 percent from 51,000 in fiscal year 1993 to over 90,000 in fiscal year 1996. These difficulties continue to plague the service primarily because the major postal stakeholders cannot all agree on common approaches to addressing their problems. The Government Performance and Results Act provides a mechanism that may be useful in focusing a dialogue that could lead to a framework agreement. GPRA provides a legislatively based mechanism for the major stakeholders, including Congress, to jointly engage in discussions that focus on the, an agency's mission and on establishing goals, measuring performance, and reporting on mission-related accomplishments. GPRA can be instrumental to the Postal Service efforts to better define its current and future role. Finally, several other areas will likely continue to require the attention of both the Postal Service and Congress. One such area is the Postal Service's automation efforts. The Postal Service has spent billions of dollars to ensure that an increase in productivity and an adequate return on planned investments are realized. Another area is the Postal Service's five-year capital investment plan from 1997 to the year 2001. It calls for investing $14.3 billion, of which $3.6 billion is designated for technology investments. Also included is $6.6 billion for planned infrastructure improvements, such as maintaining and improving over 35,000 postal facilities and upgrading the vehicle fleet of more than 200,000 vehicles. In addition, customer satisfaction at both the residential and business levels will continue to be a critical area as the Postal Service strives to improve customer service in order to remain competitive. The Postal Service has made considerable progress in improving its financial and operational performance. Sustaining this progress will be dependent upon ensuring that the key issues we identified, such as controlling costs, protecting revenues, and clarifying the role of the Postal Service in an increasingly competitive communications market, are effectively addressed by the Postal Service in Congress. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. We'd be happy to respond to any questions you or the other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Motley. I appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, let me begin by getting to one of the, uh, I think, key components of, of both the uh, studies that you've been doing and certainly uh, one of the key questions to what this subcommittee has been looking at, and that is trying to structure uh, the Postal Service for the 21st century. Uh, any number of your reports, as you have recounted here today in recent uh, months, have, have pointed out some <laughs> difficulties at best, some might argue very serious operational difficulties within the Postal Service. You talked about uh, in, in past reports in your testimony today the internal controls over express mail corporate accounts. You've, you've talked about uh, the bulk mail acceptance practices as you noted here this afternoon that uh, perhaps uh, placed as much as nine and a half billion dollars of revenues at risk. And, and you talked about uh, uh, the ethics situation uh, that uh, particularly pertained to acquisitions and, and how that's been very problematic. Uh, in your testimony, you noted, and as I read the Postmaster General's testimony that he will present later to us, uh, that the Post Office has begun to move on, on these findings. And yes, the sir. Word, the word you used was taking action or develop plans here today. Uh, and, and that's a positive thing. That's, yes, sir. I suppose, what you feel you're in existence for, to have that statement and then the subsequent reaction. That's correct. The question we have to deal with as we look at reform and the possibility of providing the Postal Service with more flexibility is do they, do they deserve it and can they be trusted with it? Uh, I think... Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Well, I was just going to say, beyond having taken action or developed plans, in your judgment, or are you able to form a judgment, have those actions been enough? Will they be sufficient? Or are they still falling short? And do they deserve more flexibility? Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a lot of ways to respond to your question. Uh, I think it's important to note at first that all the areas that we've looked at, uh, the ones that you've mentioned, bulk mail, EMCA accounts, and even the ethics issues in the procurement, all of these areas had internal controls in place. And it was the uh, 
the Postal Service and the management in the Postal Service that didn't give proper attention to those existing management and internal controls that resulted in the kind of problems that existed. Our reports, I think, brought these things further to the attention of the Postal Service, and as a result of those, they've said that uh, now is the opportunity for us to strengthen these controls, change some of our policies. I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, at this point, the watchword for the GIO, I believe, as well as the subcommittee, is continued oversight. I think uh, we need to continue to watch how these kinds of management actions are being implemented by the Postal Service, see if these internal controls really are effective that they've put in place, and continue to revisit these over time. Uh, your question about whether or not they should have greater flexibility and responsibility becomes a difficult one. I think uh, with that greater flexibility and responsibility, continued oversight is, is also necessary. So I wouldn't suggest that um, in any way that uh, we should just let the Postal Service go on and take on more and more responsibility, but there should be a partnership that exists uh, with the subcommittee as well as other oversight uh, entities within the Postal Service itself uh, to keep a watchword on these things. So it's a work in progress. Yes, sir, I would say so. You don't have any particular criticisms to levy at this point, but urge oversight and caution. I, 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 would, I would say so. Okay. I, I, if I was to say anything, Mr. Chairman, uh, with regard to a watchword is uh, GAO has been auditing the Postal Service for a very long time. I know that table over there is fairly large, but we probably could have been, brought in about 350 GAO reports that deal with the Postal Service, and I would suggest to you that many of them are on the same issues. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to ethics issues that are addressed in our testimony and that you mentioned, uh, if you look at what the Office of Government Ethics did, I mean, they, they, uh, I mean, if you went back to 1978, many of these issues were brought to their attention. 1997, it's taken a long time for changes to take place. Uh, yeah, I have no doubt you could fill that table and, and any number of others. Um, Let's let's take a few steps into the future. You mentioned <clears throat> oversight, and 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 I suppose that is related in some ways to uh, participation in in forming the future. And I'm thinking specifically about the GPRA. Uh, you noted in your testimony one of the more troubling aspects of the current postal situation, or the continuing. Uh, strife is the continuing strife between labor and management. Uh, I yes. couldn't agree more. And you offer the, oper the hope that GPRA uh, can provide uh, a means by which to begin to settle some of those issues. Yes, sir. Provide a framework for the beginning. Uh, do you have any opinions at this time as to how serious an effort may be provided? Uh, there, there seems to be some discussion as to when a pre-draft of the final uh, postal service report may be available, and will it be available in a in a time frame that makes meaningful input and discussion possible? Have you had a chance to look at, at that question? Well, we we've had some discussions, uh, a fair number of discussions, actually, with the postal service, and we've been coordinating with the uh, subcommittee. And as you know, GPRA provides a fair amount of guidance. Um, with regard to the kind of goals and strategies that will be looked for by the Congress, I think, when the final reports arrive on September 30th. However, GPRA has some very significant um, milestones in it. I would uh, conclude that those milestones are having conversations and consultations with the oversight entities up here on the, on the Hill, as well as with their uh, individual stakeholders. The discussions that we've had to date, uh, the Postal Service is not at a point where they have a draft document that uh, can be a forum for consultation uh, to, to a great degree in identifying what their goals are and the actual strategies in getting to those goals. As a result, uh, the stakeholders don't have that opportunity either to get a better understanding of what the Postal Service's goals are, nor the strategies which could have a significant impact on them. So the draft document becomes a very important one. Uh, here we are in uh, uh, this time of the year, and September's coming up on us very quickly, so I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that having that draft is sooner than later is going to be a very important factor. Well, maybe there are some people in this room who heard that. I did. Okay. Uh, I was 
hoping that the ranking member who had to step out momentarily would be able to be back uh, before I yielded, but uh, he obviously has, uh, his business has taken a bit more time. So uh, I did, we have a number of members who are very, uh, very kindly uh, joined us, so I, I want to be sure to yield them time. And according to the rules, I now yield to uh, Mr. LaTourette. Any questions he might have? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as I looked at uh, your written testimony today and, and also uh, the report of March uh, of this year regarding uh, post office closings, I, I had a couple of questions, one about the grievance procedure and then two uh, about post office closings. And well, as I looked at the statistics in the March report uh, and, and I focused on um, the number of post office closings that were appealed, uh, yes, it, it appeared to me if I read your, your statistics uh, accurately, that uh, of the appeals filed uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, the post office was permitted to proceed with its whatever its original plan had been, and 20 percent of them, roughly, uh, two out of ten, were sent back to the service for review and further disposition. Has, has there been any follow-up uh, to that? I mean, is there any success rate at all, I guess is what I'm asking you, when a community uh, appeals the closure of its postal facility. There, I, I don't have the uh, the numbers at my fingertips, uh, Congressman LaTourette, but uh, we can certainly provide those for the record. There are instances where the Postal Service does decide to reopen the facility, but I will uh, provide those for the record. Okay. And one, I guess the the difficulty that I have with with uh, certainly not with the report because it's very well done, but uh, with this concept and what people always come up to me at home and say are that. The Postal Service is, is more than a business, and, and what, what they're concerned about, everybody applauds the fact that uh, we've had a net income of $1.6 billion, and it's the second profitable year, and things are going good. But, but the, the senior citizen who relies on the opportunity to cross the street and go to her or his uh, uh, post office and buy stamps and knows the postal clerk, that, it, that it's more than just somebody handing out letters or just stuffing stuff in their mailbox. And uh, As you looked at... Uh, at the, at the closing uh, procedure, it, it appeared that uh, it was almost a, an attrition type thing, that, that the Postal Service wasn't taking affirmative action, but when then a postmaster resigned or retired or, or was transferred or the lease on the building ran out, that's when the vast majority of closings were occurring. That's that generally action. what triggers uh, a postal, uh, the Postal Service to consider the closing action, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and. I guess the, the last question I'd have on, on the appeal process was, it, did you get a sense or do you have a sense that the concerns of the affected community are, are adequately and fairly heard by the service as they go through the appeal process and reaching their eventual conclusion? Actually, we were looking at the process and the various things in the process. We didn't look behind, as you might suggest, uh, really the concerns that the community brought up. The role that the Postal Rate Commission plays in that way is to look at whether or not the Postal Service in some way has addressed the concerns of the community, and if they believe that they have not, then they remand it back to the Postal Service for further work. Okay. The second set of questions I have deal with uh, uh, the grievances, because that's something that's been brought to my attention. And, and just three sets of uh, separate news stories that I saw over the course of the fall. One was the $1.6 billion net income by the Postal Service. The second one that appeared in a number of stamp collector magazines and other articles uh, had to do with bonuses being paid to supervisors in the Postal Service. And then the third, which you accurately reflect in your report, it has also been in print other places that, that in, we have an increase, a 76 percent increase in yes. grievances filed against the Postal Service. Some would, would argue, and, and some in Ohio that, that uh, contact me from time to time, say that those three events are not unrelated. Uh, and, and in that, the pressure to turn a, 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 a service that has been financially troubled into a money maker, if you will, uh, has led to the need to incentivize supervisors and hand out bonuses, which has placed pressure upon those supervisors to uh, become, uh, I don't, I, I'm at a loss for the word stringent comes to mind, but that's not, I think you know what I mean. Yes, sir. Uh, upon the rank and file postal worker that has led to a 76 percent increase in grievance filings. Is there anything from your uh, study that, that reflects on that one way or another? Well, I might uh, take you back uh, to a little bit earlier study that GAO did. It was in 1994, was issued in September 1994, that dealt with the labor management relations in the Postal Service. Uh, there was characterized maybe uh, the word that you were looking at, an autocratic management style. 
And that particular report recognized uh, that uh, the problems that existed in the labor management relations uh, at the workroom floor level. Um, we had a variety of recommendations in that particular report that addressed uh, specifically some of the concerns that you mentioned about supervisors and how those supervisors might interact with workers on the workroom floor. The Postal Service has generated uh, a variety of initiatives to try and address those problems. But as I highlighted in the testimony, a lot of times the Postal Service and its unions and management associations are not able to agree on how to go forward with some of these initiatives. And this is why I indicated that GPRA may be an avenue for these people to come a little bit closer together and agree on the goals that they would like to uh, achieve in the long term. Um, some of the, we're currently looking at the initiatives and uh, at the request of the chairman, uh, re-looking at those and trying to make a determination of whether or not the, they have been effective to this degree uh, in trying to help. Uh, I, that answers my question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Yes, Madeline. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Davis. The, uh, d just for the edification of, of uh, the audiences, <clears throat> well as the members, uh, the committee rules provide that uh, members are recognizing the ordinance of the appearance at the time the gavel came down and then uh, by seniority. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you indicated in your testimony that there were some areas of weakness in terms of internal controls yes, sir. that you found. Then you indicated that afterwards there had been some movement towards correction. Did you find this to be significant or do you think that it will actually move in a serious way to correct the problem? Uh, Mr. Davis, I believe that the actions taken by the Postal Service uh, in most of the cases that we looked at, especially, let me particularly address EMCA and the bulk mail services, uh, I think they're fairly significant actions that they've taken. I think they've tried to recognize uh, very fully on the uh, express mail corporate account level uh, the uh, concern that we expressed in our report about it being able to identify people or having some kind of verification of their addresses when they apply for express mail corporate accounts. Uh, they have taken action to raise the limits for opening a corporate account as well as the uh, amount that's required to maintain in the balance of those corporate accounts. And uh, they've taken some additional actions and uh, sent out uh, directives to uh, the various locations throughout the United States for people to pay more attention to these things. If I were to suggest an area that uh, maybe needs some additional attention, uh, we suggest in our report that one of the big problem areas in accepting express mail corporate accounts was in the mail processing facilities where there was no way or sometimes very little time to process the corporate account information. Uh, the Postal Service has indicated that they plan to put some terminals in place, but we have no guidance as to what kind of time frame might exist. Uh, but it appears to us they're trying to make some headway in that area. Very similarly, in the uh, bulk mail area, uh, they ha are instituting additional training as well as taking other efforts to ensure that uh, uh, the kind of problems that we identified uh, are caught early on. I think this becomes even more important now that reclassification is pretty much in full swing because more and more businesses will be using the opportunity to use barcodes and uh, things of that sort that the Postal Service will be required to check at those bulk mail facilities. You also indicated that there was a significant amount of difference between overnight delivery and two or three day. Yes, sir. That overnight is 91 percent. Two, three day, 80 to 83. Yes, sir. Does the 80 to 83 represent cause for concern, or is it just a difference between the two? I think in an organization that uh, is attending to pride itself uh, as a uh, premier uh, organization delivering the mail, I think those things are very important, not only from the Postal Service's perspective, but I think from the mailer's perspective who put that mail into the mail stream. Uh, I believe a lot of the concentration by the Postal Service over the last several years has been on uh, overnight delivery. Uh, they've done a good job of improving those statistics, and I, I believe it's significant now that they uh, turn their attention to some of these other areas. Oh, okay. But, okay. but, but we're not suggesting 
that we're in some serious difficulty there because of the, the lower rating of productivity? Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that it's a serious difficulty, but I believe it's an area that the Postal Service has to give attention to. Certainly something to look at and to yes. be concerned about. You also mentioned um, possibly looking at the Board of Governors in terms of the way in which they operate. Oftentimes, I know that when we review, we do so with something in mind. Sometimes we review for the sake of knowing, but we also review with an idea in mind or something specifically that we might be looking for. Are we looking specifically at or for something in this instance? Uh, I think really what we're looking for here, Mr. Davis, is whether or not there are opportunities for improvement, uh, whether or not there are opportunities in comparison to other uh, federally charged agencies that have similar organizational structures as the Postal Service uh, with Board of Directors involved as to whether or not there's some particular thing that uh, might draw us to either a requirement or a need for legislative change or something that might make the operations of the Postal Service more efficient or effective. Uh, I think that's really what we're looking for in those things. We didn't have a particular goal in mind in terms of we want to look at a particular issue to see if it's wrong or right but we wanted to see if there was opportunities for something better. And when we did that through talking to all the Board of Governors, as, as well as many of those that uh, have been in that position before the current ones. When you're reviewing agencies, do you also look at things that may not be <coughs> specifically outlined just in terms of what might be overall goals and directions of the nation like affirmative action and, 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 and how performance might be with those agencies? We look at a variety of those things, yes, sir, Mr. Davis. Did you observe anything with the, the Postal Service? Well, uh, we haven't specifically instance? honed in on I, I meant to infer that uh, the, the charge that the Congress provides us, either through the chairman or ranking minority members or other uh, interested parties here on Capitol Hill, uh, we, we look into almost any issues related to individual agency activities and operations. We have not looked specifically at the kind of issue that you might be addressing here. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, think I heard you say that $1.5 billion was the net uh, revenue. Uh, I believe it was 1.6 1. 1. 6 billion. 1.6 billion with the net revenue. What was the gross revenue? Fifty six billion. I'm sorry. Six billion. But you, you keep in mind, Mr. Owens, that the postal service is intended to be a break-even organization, and a lot of times, generally, what happens uh, is it's sort of cyclical. The first year, or so after a rate increase, you'll see a fairly substantial uh, uh, profit. Uh, the next year, you generally see something along no, I, the line really, of break-even. I'm okay. going in a different direction. Okay. <laughs> no problem. I'm sorry. You spoke about the important oversight responsibilities of Congress. Yes, sir. The oversight responsibilities of Congress boil down mainly to this subcommittee. We once had a whole committee which was responsible for the oversight of the post office. Do you think that uh, as things go, the ratio of congressional oversight to the large size of this agency, the importance of it, is, is, is a proper one. Should we have a subcommittee really as the main oversight body or should we not have a major committee considering the size of the agency's uh, budget, the size of the operation and the importance of it to every American uh, citizen? Uh, are, we, are we, the question is, you know, in the scheme of things, do we have appropriate, effective, Oversight capacity. Um, well, that, that's a, a question I, I don't know that I'm in a position to answer directly about whether or not there should be a full committee or just a subcommittee. I, I would contend, Mr. Owens, that this subcommittee uh, has done a, a tremendous job in the last several years uh, charged with the responsibilities it has to Well, bring we have an extraordinarily hardworking chairman. And, yes, sir. And I, I take off my hat to him, but the amount of staff he has, the budget he has, is far different from the 
committee that once had oversight uh, for, for the sure, Postal Services. Sure. And I just wondered if you had any... any uh, uh, no, no particular thoughts. I really believe that's a policy decision for the Congress to make. Regular delivery uh, is lagging, you said, behind overnight delivery, because overnight they're competing with the private sector, and they put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, did you do your own audits of Pricewaterhouse, or did you accept their figures and you're quoting their figures? Uh, we've accepted uh, the Pricewaterhouse figures, Mr. Owens, that are published by the Postal Service. And I might just clarify that this overnight delivery is the overnight residential one-day delivery first-class mail, which is your 32-cent mail. Do you think that the Price Waterhouse auditing mechanism is an appropriate one? I mean, uh, should we have several different auditing firms or should we change auditing firms uh, every year? Uh, you know, it, it's a contract that's gone on for some time now, and I, I wondered if you'd comment on that. Uh, we have not really looked at the Price Waterhouse contract, and I, I'm really not in a position to... Well, it's a situation where the same contractor has a contract to evaluate an organization over a long period of time. Is that a sound one, uh, you know, in GAO, the GAO way of looking at things? I think, Mr. Owens, a lot determines on how the contract awards are made. And a lot of time, uh, I do not know uh, if this is a sole source contract or a competitive contract. But I think uh, it would make a significant difference as to how this uh, was put out on the street. Yeah, and and we have not looked at that. If it's competitive, it's all right to have the same one for two well, years. Well, I, I wouldn't suggest that it's a sole source, that it wouldn't be okay. I think you really have to look into that in more detail. Just on a basic principle, the fact that you're paying for a service from one entity uh, does not set up a situation for conflicts of interest, you think? Uh, I don't believe so. I, I think those things are within the bounds of the contracting regulations that the Postal Service operates under. Mm -hmm. On labor management, uh, yes, did you look at racial discrimination and its, its impact on, on we, we did not, Mr. the situation Owens. at all? We did not. You didn't look at any grievances that have been brought by black groups, uh, Hispanic groups, and that, that whole phenomenon? We that, have not, Mr. Owens. There are several suits that are underway, I understand. Yes, you sir. You didn't take a look at those at all? We, we have not, Mr. Owens. Why did you not? Uh, well, of labor management what, is what we've been concentrating our efforts on in the labor management area is the initiatives that have been uh, started by the Postal Service and the actions that have been taken under those initiatives by the various uh, postal unions as well as the management associations. So we've looked at it from a very topical uh, point of the initiatives themselves and what has taken place in the agreements that they've reached under those initiatives and whether or not we believe, as well, at, based on talking to the union officials and postal office officials, whether or not there has been progress in that area. Did you compare their due process procedures with other agencies of comparable size? If you're referring to the arbitration process, it's a fairly common one throughout the government. I mean, when an individual has a grievance and the process that goes through... Yes, sir. It's, it's generally a four- to, to five-step process. It's very similar in most agencies. Is it, is it as good as the Army's? Uh, I'm not familiar with the Army, sir. Did you look at training at all? This is a huge organization, huge budget, large numbers of moving sure. parts, large numbers of employees, large amount of investment in, in state-of-the-art technology. Uh, what are the training procedures? Did you look at the training procedures for employees? Uh, we've uh, looked at Sensitivity some of training in terms of labor management. Uh, any, any training procedures? We've looked at some of the training procedures as it relates to some of the specific initiatives that they have underway, um, but we have not looked at their entire training activities. I asked this question two years ago of the, I think the postmaster general. Uh, you didn't see any films, any videos any websites or classes uh, that are regularly run uh, as a system for training you didn't notice, uh, didn't... I, I'm aware, uh, not uh, very heavily aware, I am aware that the Postal Service has an extensive training program that they do use videos and uh, things of that sort. I'm aware that they do I've been do trying to get a, a copy for two years of some training film. Well, it, it, I'm sure if they're available, Mr. Runyon will make them available to you, but... Uh, if, if you need our assistance in doing that, we'd be happy to help you. I might have to call on you. I We're got ranking. one video which deals with, this is your post office, a nice, it's a nice film, you know, okay. for introducing children to the post office, but uh, adults. But I'd be happy to started, get it for you. You know, a system of training that an organization of that size you would expect would, would have. Uh, so personnel development uh, and training for personnel 
you didn't see figuring into that whole labor management problem that well, I, I actually think that is a part of the whole labor management process, Mr. Owens. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I, I'm, what I'm suggesting is we did not look at that whole process in the work that we've done to date. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. I just want to make sure I got this straight. More budget, more staff, and I'd be a full committee chair. We should talk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying hard. We both New Yorkers. <laughs> we may have strike on something. Uh, Mr. Gilman. Mr. Chairman, I regret that I had to be at another meeting earlier, um, and I welcome, I commend you for continuing these series of oversight on postal services. Uh, I welcome learning a little more about the proposal to centralize uniform purchasing procedures. I strongly support the postal services attempt to have cost efficiency. However, it is important that the postal service provide adequate protection to guard against adversely affecting our U.S. garment industry as well as to prevent uh, the utilization of sweatshops uh, in this process. And I look forward to hearing the testimony of Postmaster General Runyon concerning the issues he's confronted with in uh, providing service and cost efficiency. But let me ask uh, a question of our GAO. Some economists specializing in postal issues have raised doubts whether the Postal Service can remain viable in its current form. Would you care to comment on that? Well, uh, that probably is a uh, understandable concern that they might have, Mr. Gilman. The, uh, uh, the Postal Service has been threatened by competitors for an awfully long time now, and uh, something that uh, I won't say is new on the scene, but in the last 10 years or so, the telecommunications uh, market uh, has started to cut into the Postal Service quite extensively. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Runyon, in uh, leading the Postal Service, has recognized this and attempted in a variety of ways to uh, create a better service and to uh, try and see how he might be able to stem some of the concerns that exist there. I believe uh, in the future, as communications through the computer and households start to afford these more and more, you'll see some of the uh, mail streams such as First Class, which is a very large genera revenue generator for the Postal Service, uh, start to change significantly. Uh, I, I know that this is one of the reasons that the Chairman uh, has expressed concern and uh, proposed H.R. 22 as a reform measures, uh, beginning of the reform measures for the Postal Service. In your testimony, you mentioned how the Postal Service goes about closing post offices. Coming from a district that I have that includes many small rural uh, services and substations, I wonder if you can comment on how such closings affect service in the more rural areas. Uh, we have not directly looked at uh, those closings in the rural areas in the services that were provided. However, uh, the process that the Postal Service is supposed to follow is that when services are either terminated as a result of a closing of a facility or an emergency suspension of operations, so they're supposed to provide alternate services and notify those customers. And have you uh, tried to do some oversight on whether that's being done? At this point, Mr. Gilman, we've just looked at the process related to both the closing and the emergency suspensions. We have not looked at the details of actually what happens. And I would hope at some future date you could undertake an overview of that process to make sure that we're not uh, deteriorating the service in the rural areas. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now we're pleased to turn to the esteemed ranking member, Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be brief uh, so that we can uh, move on, but th there are a couple of things. One is I do want to underline um, something that I agree with in your uh, testimony on page 10 when you said that one of the most important areas uh, for oversight is labor management relations. Yes, sir. Um, and you felt that congressional oversight was uh, very important in that area, and you talked about its drag on productivity to the degree that uh, some of these longstanding grievances are not resolved. But you point to the Government uh, Performance and Results Act as later on in your testimony as a, perhaps a vehicle or a context under which uh, um, you know, some of these issues might get, 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 get handled. Um, I'm not, I understand the thrust of your, your comments, but y you are aware that at least as the act is structured, uh, labor organizations are not indicated as being stakeholders, even though I think 
from a commonsensical viewpoint, we would think of them in the postal context as being major stakeholders. Yeah. Well, Mr. Fata, we might differ in that view somewhat, okay. I guess, because in my feeling that as GPRA was uh, structured, my sense is, is that the agency is supposed to coordinate with its stakeholders and if, and if in consultations with the Congress as well. Right. Um, and I would view uh, both the uh, unions, the management associations, major mailers, uh, as, as stakeholders in the direction that the Postal Service might go. Well, I don't, I don't think we would disagree. I would agree. I'm just oh, saying okay, I don't think the act is as specific uh, as, <laughs> as uh, identifying uh, labor organizations as one of the stakeholders, even though I, I, I'd said from a commonsensical oh, point of view, uh, one would hope that they would be, but I just wanted to make that, that point. Uh, I understand all of your testimony I want you to see if you could help the committee understand why you think the Postal Service has been so financially successful uh, under the uh, Postmaster General's uh, in, in the management team's uh, work there. Well, I, I think there are a variety of things that point to the success of the Postal Service financially. Uh, some of those can be attributable to a uh, long-term automation program that was put in effect many, many years ago that I think you're starting to see you're starting to see some changes over time. I think there's some inefficient efficiencies that the Postal Service has, has, um, has, has tried to make. And I think in some of the markets that are substantial revenue generators for the Postal Service, you've seen increased emphasis. And as a result, you've seen a fairly substantial increase in the volume in those mail categories. For example, priority mail. Priority mail is a fairly strong revenue generator, even though it's a very small piece of the large revenue pie that the Postal Service has. But there's been a strong emphasis in that area. As a result, the Postal Service has done fairly well. Express mail is another area, again, small. Where you have seen additional revenue generation is at the first class mail level, where the rate of growth has not been as substantial in past years. Uh, but there's still a fair, you know, there's still some growth in that first class mail category, which again... Now, in uh, your testimony, you talked about yes. first class for a minute. You, you talked about the high rate of uh, performance there. Yes, sir. Uh, but you said that some customers were concerned uh, that perhaps in the two to three day uh, mail that they, they were, we were at about an 80, 80 something um, performance rate there. Yes, sir. Maybe there was some prioritization. Um, in which first class was, uh, you know, uh, a management priority um, to, the, to, to the detriment uh, of these other categories. The management has to set some priorities. Yes, sir, I agree. So I wasn't, it wasn't clear from your comment whether you were just acknowledging that some customers may have made that com complaint or whether the GAO was saying uh, that, that if that was a prioritization, that that was in inappropriate. Uh, no, um, sir, I wasn't inferring that it was an in inappropriate view. one. We don't have evidence to suggest that there was emphasis on first class to provide some detriment to the, uh, or to the second and third day mail. Uh, it's just an expression that there have customers have con you know, expressed that concern. I, I understand, but let me, let me say this, that I'm sure that there have been a lot of complaints. At least my office yes, has gotten all kinds of different complaints about the Postal Service. Yes, sir. You mentioned that one in your report, and so that's why what drew it you know, drew me to it um, as if you were suggesting that, you know, either it was, it was accurate or if it was accurate that it was inappropriate. And I haven't been able to elicit from you a judgment yet. If, in fact, that was the case, would that be inappropriate? Uh, I would, uh, um, I, I would uh, fail to, uh, uh, I'd be failing in the audit work that we've done to suggest that it was inappropriate. Okay. Mr. Fatah, I would suggest that if the Postal Service intends to be the first class organization that it would like to be, that it needs to put the kind of emphasis on two and three day mail that it's done on the first class mail, okay. first day one. Now, now you also, um, and this is my last, uh, Mr. Chairman, last uh, question, you refer to the Canadian circumstance and the reforms that have taken place. Uh, yes, sir. You also talk about the fact that uh, even though they've maintained uniform, uh, uniform, uh, 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 postal uh, uh, rates uh, for, you know, I guess what would be comparable to first class delivery uh, to residents, that they have scaled back the frequency of delivery 
Uh, and they've also closed down uh, many of their postal outlets in rural areas. Um, could you speak any more specifically to what they've done, um, you know, especially in terms of this issue of reduction of delivery? Is that they've moved from a daily delivery to something less? Well, than let, let me give you an example. On, on some of the business deliveries in the uh, Canadian postal system, uh, they were delivering as many as uh, five or six times a day. Okay. And what they have done is cut that back to uh, generally fewer times, sometimes just one time a day. And so from a cutback from that standpoint, that's have been, been able to save additional funds. Uh, with regard to uh, the rural closings, in many instances, one of the approaches the Canadian Post has used is contract post offices where they've contracted these out to the private sector to ensure that they have trying to fulfill their universal mandate of providing services. Um, maybe Ms. Anderson would like to add some more to that. About the concern on the closings of rural post offices, as we understand it, the uh, Canadian Post imposed a moratorium on any further closings in rural areas. That, that is the Canadian government imposed the moratorium. Right. That's correct. Because the, the CPC would have proceeded forward after right. the moratorium. Yes, sir. That's correct. I want to thank the chairman. Uh, and uh, if there are any other questions that... Uh, deserve our attention uh, at this hearing, but uh, we do have uh, uh, the Postmaster General very patiently waiting, and I'd like to move along to him. As you have so graciously done in the past, I would ask that you uh, please assist us again in responding and writing to uh, questions that both I and uh, if the other members of the subcommittee would care to uh, submit in writing, uh, you could put those uh, answers on the record. And uh, we look forward to working with you. As you noted in your testimony, you do have a number of studies underway dealing with the authorities of the, post uh, the uh, Postal Board of Governors, for example, and others. So uh, as, uh, as much as we've enjoyed our relationship in the past, we're looking forward to uh, even more productive one in the future. And so thank you again. Thank for you, Mr. Here. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, with that, we uh, can immediately start uh, our second panel. And before uh, the two gentlemen are seated, let me uh, administer the oath. Thank you. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to present will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Record will show that uh, both gentlemen responded to the oath in the affirmative. Gentlemen, welcome. I. Uh, Noted uh, in my opening statement, uh, at least financially, you've had a very successful year. Uh, we heard a question earlier as to uh, how the recent success of the post office has come about, the Postal Service, and I suppose there are many answers to it. Certainly the workers who have done an, an absolutely incredible <coughs> job through some less than ideal weather conditions, particularly as of late. and, and meeting those uh, proverbial appointed rounds. But uh, as I noted as well, a uh, good share of that credit has to fall upon management and the efforts that you've made. So as the two top representatives of that management part of the team, uh, we thank you. And we welcome you here today, and we look forward to your testimony. So uh, Postmaster General Runyon, I would uh, uh, welcome you again and say uh, our attention is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with me today is uh, Deputy Postmaster General Mike Coughlin. And in the interest of time, uh, I would like to summarize the testimony that you received and ask that the full testimony be received into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I'm pleased to report to the committee that the state of the Postal Service is very good. Uh, financially, we expect to turn a third consecutive year of profit. Uh, volume continues to climb, although behind what we had hoped. Uh, we have rather feeble growth in first-class mail, and that's a particular concern to us. We think it's a sign of the growing challenge that we face from rapidly developing communication technologies. We also face key challenges to raise our two- and three-day first-class service scores and to improve labor management relations. Customer satisfaction and customer support remain extremely strong. We're making steady progress implementing Customer Perfect, our effort to bring the Baldrige principles of management to the Postal Service. We're integrating the new office of the Inspector General into the organization. 
We continue to work closely with major customer segments, getting their input and their perspective. That's especially true when it comes to legislative reform. Legislatively, there are four key pillars that we think are necessary. Any bill must preserve universal service. The second, it must provide practical incentives to control cost. Third, it must support products that meet changing customer and marketplace needs. And lastly, it must modernize the rate making process. For the immediate future, we're working closely with the governors, examining the revenue needs and the rate structure for next year and beyond. During his appearance last month, Chairman Del Honco indicated the governors would likely have a decision uh, within 60 to 90 days, and I believe that the board will hold to that schedule. Mr. Chairman, that's a quick snapshot of the Postal Service today, and uh, I would like to ask, as I say, the full testimony to be entered into the record. Also, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, your permission to make another comment at this time. Uh, you ask a question of the governors when they were here, uh, if they care to say anything about the Coke matter that's under investigation by the Department of Justice. Uh, I would like to respond to that question at this time, if I could. Please do. Yes, sir. I'd like to give you the facts as they relate to myself in this matter. In 1977, I invested less than $13,000 in Coca-Cola stock. Um, in uh, 12 years later, I went to the Tennessee Valley Authority. That stock was placed in a blind trust. When I left there in 1992, it was still in a blind trust. Uh, in December of 92 and December of 93, I met with my financial advisor. Each time he told me that he thought that I should get out of that blind trust if possible because the returns on the blind trust were not meeting market value. I talked to my, in 94, I talked to my general counsel and ethics advisor and asked him if it was necessary, <coughs> excuse me, as a postmaster general to have a blind trust. I was told that that was not customary and wasn't necessary, at which time they helped me with the Office of Government Ethics to remove myself from that blind trust, which I did. At that time, I was assured that if there were going to be conflicts, they would inform me of it. Later, the uh, alliance with Coke was originated by our marketing department. Um, I did not ask that that be done. I didn't think of that idea. It was something the marketing department had. I attended a few of those meetings. After one of those meetings, uh, a lawyer from General Counsel's office in her behalf uh, came to me and said that I should recuse my uh, Coke stock, recuse myself from dealing in the uh, Coke matter because I owned Coke stock. And I might consider divesting myself. I recused myself immediately, never entered into any other discussions uh, with the uh, Coca-Cola matter. I immediately asked my general counsel to assist me with the Office of Government Ethics to divest myself of the Coke stock. Um, I got the permission to divest myself of that Coke stock, and uh, at that time, when I got it, I immediately divested myself. So I did both things that were recommended uh, both to recuse myself and divest the stock. I was told I might ought to do one or the other. I did both. Um, and when I divested myself of that stock, I did not receive any profit as a result of it uh, because the Coke Alliance uh, never took place. There was a, a thought that I would receive money in excess of what the stock was worth because of the alliance between the Postal Service and Coke. That didn't happen. I did not receive any profit. I have um, been in, in public service now for nine years. I was in um, private business for 43 years before that. And I have never had a question asked about my ethics before. Uh, this is really a, a rather traumatic thing with me. Um, it, it is something that I would never have expected. Uh, it's not something that I'm 
really thrilled about it. I don't really like to talk about it, but the fact is it's there. And it shouldn't be there. Um, I'm in government service not to make money. I didn't come here to make money. Uh, I came here because I had an opportunity to come. And I feel that if people have an opportunity to provide government service, they should take it. Uh, I owe a lot to this government. I've, it's been very good to me for 72 years. Uh, it's given me more opportunities than you can imagine. Um, when President Reagan and uh, his chief of staff, uh, Howard Baker, asked me to serve as chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, I saw that as an opportunity to do just what I said, and that is to give something back to my country. Uh, I did serve uh, during World War II in the service, uh, as many of us did, but I think it, that more is required if you can provide it. I saw that as an opportunity. I also saw it as an opportunity to give something to my government because if we could prove that government could operate as efficiently as a business, then that would be a big benefit to the government. We proved that at TVA, and we're doing a, a pretty good job of doing that at the Postal Service at the present time. Um, so I saw this as the opportunity to, to repay a debt that I felt I owed. I think that basically covers everything about the facts. Uh, as you know, the uh, Department of Justice has an ongoing uh, in, uh, in inquiry. It's been ongoing now for uh, eight months and uh, will continue for I don't know how long. Um, I'm sure the chairman can appreciate the sensitivity connected with this inquiry. Uh, I have nothing to hide, and that's why I'm uh, here today prepared to answer questions if you would have any questions on this matter. I would appreciate, though, the chance if uh, you ask very detailed questions uh, to provide uh, detailed answers in writing so that there could be no misinterpretation about what those answers were. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be glad to take any questions. and. Uh, if you have any on that subject, if not, then Mike and I'd be glad to talk about the post office. Well, I'd, I'd thank the uh, gentleman for his comments. And uh, as I, I uh, believe he indicated, they were not part of your prepared testimony. And I wasn't aware you were going to make them. But uh, I was pleased to uh, have the subcommittee give you that, that chance. And uh, let me first start by saying I certainly, as an individual, have never in my mind questioned your motivations as to why you are serving in the position that you hold. Anyone with a second grade, grade uh, ability to read the English language and cares to read your resume would understand that you have probably been in far more lucrative positions in the past than you are now. Uh, and I, I admire the the devotion and dedication to your country that you bring to this job. Uh, as you indicated very correctly, I provided the, post, uh, the Postal Board of Governors the opportunity to comment, should they so choose. I did so because we are an oversight committee, by definition. And no matter how distasteful the circumstance is to you personally, and I fully understand that, it is nevertheless a topic that as a legitimate oversight committee we are forced to face. And I wanted the record to show what was obvious to everyone who knows anything about the Postal Service that this issue was out there. And that insofar as I was concerned, I felt it best for everyone's interest. The taxpayer, the Postal Service, its customers, this subcommittee, and probably most importantly you to let that Justice Department investigation continue and hopefully reach a timely conclusion. And my opinion in the intervening time from that last hearing to this ha has not changed. Uh, I was going to provide you the opportunity to make comment as I did the Postal Board of Governors with the same assurance to them, uh, to you that I made to them, and that is if you choose not to, I understand that. I am very hesitant. Uh, to at this time and in this forum begin a detailed hearing on that circumstance. Uh, I'm not aware that we have 
half the facts, let, all of them, let alone all of them. I don't believe you came prepared truly to answer those questions. If you did, uh, that's fine, uh, but, but I wouldn't want to make that yes. And so I, I, as the chairman, would suggest to my fellow members here, and we run a democracy on this subcommittee, and if I'm overruled, so be it, that we take your statement for the record as you made it today, and that we continue to allow the Justice Department to finish, and then we will go into this matter because it's far too important for us to overlook. Um, I would also say that while it's my opinion we should let the Justice Department continue its work. I don't think that should be forever. Eight months is a long time and uh, we have expressed, if we haven't, in this week uh, we had a meeting yesterday with the subcommittee staff and we decided we will express our interest in seeing this brought to a timely conclusion. I would hope you'd support that kind of initiative. I certainly uh, would. Uh, so justice delayed is justice in my, in my opinion. So I, I would, on that topic, <coughs> yield to any other members who may have uh, uh, any comments on that and certainly to the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah. Well, Mr. Chairman, we discussed this somewhat at the last hearing. My feelings have not uh, changed, which is that uh, I think that um, uh, Washington is too, uh, is too, uh, too immersed in uh, destroying people's um, uh, reputations without any facts. Uh, if there is a, a, an investigation, um, it should be uh, brought to some conclusion and expedited. I think the Justice Department has a, a responsibility to do that. Uh, and I think that as a member of Congress, uh, at the least, we should give uh, you and anyone else uh, appearing before us or, or, or as part of the federal government, um, the protections that you fought for in the war, which is that in America you are innocent until proven guilty and uh, absent any charge, um, you should, I mean, not even be, I think, uh, put into a position in which these matters are commented on in the way that they have been in the press and in other places. Uh, I think that uh, for our committee, uh, we should be uh, focused on uh, the systems involved. Now, I would assume that the Board of Governors has in place uh, ethics uh, and accountability procedures uh, that would uh, touch upon every aspect of the Postal Service. And to the degree that that is not in place, we should, as, as part of our oversight responsibilities, try to help think through that. But we should not assume because of a headline, either related to you, um, the President of the United States, we talk about justice denied, uh, justice delayed. I mean, we, they're still looking at matters relative to, you know, 10 years ago when he was in Arkansas. I think that, um, or the Speaker of the House, anyone else, I think that these matters um, really uh, rub against uh, the whole spirit of your comment about the desire of people to want to be involved in public service. Um, and we don't, I don't think we encourage many more uh, to want to, uh, to uh, offer themselves uh, to make a contribution when they see the kind of examples that are set in a way that some of these matters are handled. So I thank the chairman for the opportunity to comment. Well, I thank uh, the gentleman for his comments. Any other member choose to address this at this time? I, I really Mr. Owens. Support your manner of handling this, Mr. Chairman, and say that as public officials, we are well aware of the barracuda approach taken by the media on these kinds of perceived wrongdoings, and it's most unfortunate. I think the American people would like to have the media direct most, more of its attention on the operations of the post office. Uh, there's a love affair with the post office. Everybody needs it, everybody wants it, everybody has high expectations. I get lots and lots of interaction and complaint about the Postal Service. I think that's what I'm, I'm here for, and, and that, that that particular matter is quite, is quite uh, minor compared with the overall work of this committee and of this uh, agency. Thank you, gentlemen. It, it does, I think, take us back, though, to one of, the, uh, one of the topics that the GAO has talked about, and that was the focus of their testimony here today, at least in part, and that is the problem of uh, procurement and, and less than well-defined ethical standards where management employees procured certain items where there was a conflict. 
And that in turn ties into the other reports that they have issued with respect to express mail corporate accounts and the problems they've delineated and also uh, to the bulk mail business acceptance practices issue. You heard uh, Mr. Motley respond to uh, your efforts to address those concerns raised in those reports as I described it a work in progress. I think it's very important that you are able to ensure, assure this subcommittee and probably even more important that you are able to assure the constituent groups and public at large that that kind of internal oversight is a primary focus of, of this new administrative team and that that in turn shows your not just need for but rather your ability to handle even more flexibility that is an important part of the, of the reform effort. You want to talk about those reports, the ethics, uh, uh, the ethics standards with respect to procurement, bulk mail, and ECMA? EMCA, yes, sir, I would like to talk about some of those. Uh, first, I would like to ask you to accept into the record uh, the program that we have. Without uh, objection, that document will be filed in its entirety. Uh, the program we have is a uh, result of an OGE report that is uh, two years old. Uh, we worked very diligently with OGE. Uh, they have uh, approved what we have, and they have given us a letter recently, uh, which I'd also like to supply for the record, although you may have that, but if you don't, I'd like to supply that for the record. We have where, a copy, and we will see that that's a Where uh, they have uh, given us a, a clean bill of health on the things that they had in their letter. I'd like to, to say further that when I first came to the Postal Service, um, I was a little surprised to find out that we had three separate entities in the Postal Service who were doing purchasing. Uh, we changed that. We have one purchasing organization now that does all the purchasing. Uh, the way it was, it, it just was not being done properly. Some of the things that, that they talked about, I think that the GEO talked about, are purchases that cover a number of years. I, I think, Mike, can you help me with that, the kinds of things they're talking about? Because some of that properties you're talking about um, have been many years in coming. One was if in I New recall, York. there were seven, seven procurements involved in the thing, and they went back, I think, as far as 1986, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, maybe the last one was around 93 or so, Mike? I believe that's right. Yeah. Well, the, the, if I might, I suppose that's true, but we also, uh, what is troubling to me, and I think what was at the core of Mr. Motley's responses is that, you know, that none of this is new, and, and certainly predates your coming in as the PMG, but it seems to uh, have a pattern of reacting and then letting things slide again. I mean, if you look at the Office of Government Ethics uh, oversight activities with respect to this issue over the years. I mean, as early as August 95, the office reported that some improvements had been made, mm -hmm. but more m work was needed. Now you have the letter. Are you going to continue to be vigilant is the question. Are you yeah. going to continue to be uh, vigorous uh, uh, trustees of this very important internal oversight activity, not just on the procurements, but on, on bulk mail and uh, where we can argue about the figures, but you're, I think the reality is pretty clear that you're losing a lot of money, or have very recently lost a lot of money uh, because of uh, uh, not uh, sufficiently stringent oversight and checking and the issues of, of uh, the uh, express mail corporate account. Mr. And, and that's what we're concerned about. Now that you're reacting and you've got a letter, but that you're going to continue to be vigilant in that area. We definitely are. You know, it is not to our advantage to let money just slide through the cracks. Uh, anytime we find a place that we can improve our revenues, we definitely are going to do that. And if it's just changing a procedure or stopping somebody from doing something that they're not doing in the right way or having them do it in the way they should do it and checking it more often, we definitely are going to do that because we don't want to give up revenue uh, unnecessarily. We don't want people to, to be able to pass mail through at less price than they should pay. So we have several groups that are working on that at the present time. 
I might add, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, that there's another group that performs some pretty heavy oversight besides this committee that probably doesn't get the attention it deserves, particularly in the last year or two, and that's the Audit Committee of our Board of Governors. Uh, they, have, they have looked at each of the, of the items that were mentioned by GAO here this afternoon, as well as a number of others, and as somebody who attends those meetings that they hold almost every month, uh, they give considerable intense uh, attention. Uh, to ensuring that the Postal Service is following up and putting into place the internal controls uh, that GAO found uh, lacking uh, in those reports. Um. Well, let, let, me, let me cite a specific. You had, uh, as, as is mentioned uh, in, in several of GAO reports, a $46 million over on your advertising account. Um, the thing that I find most troubling about that is that apparently, as I understand the issue, came to light only after there was an audit, an internal audit, that your controller had somehow, and I'd, I'd, I'd really be interested in someone explaining the, the logic of this. Someone had somehow convinced your controller, don't pay attention to the, the advertising account individually, just look at the bottom line. So if we overexpend in one area, that's not going to be a problem as long as we come all right, out all right in the end. I mean, and, and we're talking 1996, mm -hmm. so this is not ancient history. No, it's not. I mean, that, that, to me, and I spent a little time in government finance back when I had a real job and a real life and, and, and worked in, in city government. Some would argue that isn't real life too, but uh, to me it was. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty incredible arrangement to have. I could imagine me traipsing, traipsing down to the second floor in the city hall in Watertown, New York, and trying to convince the uh, city auditor to forget about the internal accounts and the end of the year will come out all right. I mean, he would have thrown me out the window. Mr. Chairman, I can guarantee you that, that does not exist any longer, and uh, that will not happen in any other department. Uh, that is now controlled totally uh, by line item and will be controlled by the controller. You're right, there was a mistake made. There was controls changed in that particular area. Uh, they are now in place and, and they will guarantee that that won't happen. Well, it's good to hear because as I said, faith and trust in your ability, and by you I mean generically the right. Postal Service, uh, to handle the issues that you have is, is essential if we're going to argue and proceed on other kinds of internal flexibility. Uh, I'd be happy to yield to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Postmaster General, uh, you know, obviously some things are going very well with the post office, uh, but part of oversight is to delve into some matters that are yet to be uh, successfully uh, handled. And I want to ask you about the principal matter that concerns me, um, which is the whole issue of labor management relations. Uh, for. The, the Postal Service has had a long history of having very hardworking people who somehow um, in their relationships with the management, uh, things just don't seem to work perfectly. And that continues to today. There's also uh, the problem of the, the fact that uh, with uh, no ability to strike, there's a grievance procedure which seems to have had a backlog uh, that is, you know, part and parcel of the whole design of it. And I'd like you to speak specifically generally to what your plans are, what you envision, how you think uh, you might be able to improve the relationships between labor and management, and also on this issue of the grievance procedure itself and the backlog. Uh, if you could uh, specifically respond to that, that would be helpful. We have uh, started having uh, meetings um, under the, uh, the summit title. And uh, Mr. John Calhoun-Wells, who's the director of the uh, Federal Mediation and Con Consolidation Service, is leading those meetings. Uh, he has uh, convened us um, three times now, I think. In addition to that, we're having separate meetings individually with unions. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things, the first thing, that we're working on is grievance procedure. We need to get the process fixed. Uh, the process, in my opinion, is not right right now. Uh, it's, it's not working. And so we need to fix the process, and we're working very diligently at this time to do that. Uh, I'm meeting with um, Mr. Sombrato and Mr. Biller to t discuss these things also, but that's at a different level. Yeah. We've got other people working 
uh, at a working group level to try to resolve how we go about solving uh, these process problems. One of the reasons that we have a lot of grievances these days is that we're undergoing a lot of change. Automation uh, is, is causing um, people to be concerned. Uh, and uh, so that creates some problems. So we do have those kinds of problems, and we are trying very desperately to, to resolve them. You want to speak to that, Mike? I don't think there's much I can add that Mr. Runyon hasn't already said. It's the combination of change. I think we have to admit that, that management itself has been inflexible um, right. at times and in certain locations around the system. And I would suggest that there may well be some, uh, a third element to the problem, and that's some structural problems or perhaps political problems within the union organizations themselves. Uh, it's a very complex problem, and I think to try to overgeneralize about what, what the cause might be uh, is probably dangerous. Question. Yeah. As part of the reform uh, uh, effort of the Congress, at some point we right. may consider uh, structurally the Board of Governors and whether there's any opportunity there, as we've seen in other major labor-intensive corporations that may be put on to the Board of Governors uh, some representative of, um, of labor or working people uh, so that the board might be more more uh, sensitized uh, or sensitive, I guess mm -hmm. it's an appropriate way to say it, to some of these issues. And I know this is a, uh, you, you, know, you may not have an immediate reaction to this notion, but we have seen it with uh, some other major uh, enterprises in our country that this has led to some level of improvement. I might just, I, I don't think I know enough about the experiences in those other industries mm -hmm. where, uh, where union representation has been on the board. I think I'd want to look at that before I swung one way or the other on the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask a, a question that I know was covered earlier with the uh, other witnesses, but uh, you would probably be better able to uh, respond to it. I represent uh, Philadelphia, and I know my colleagues are from New York, uh, both the chairman and Mr. Gilman uh, had uh, had some probably have had the similar issues raised with them about the notion of uh, decentralized procurement and how it would impact potentially uh, in terms of the purchases of uh, uniforms. Um, and I know that you know we we may seem like we're working at cross purposes here. We want you to make as much money as you can make, uh, but the other thing we don't want to see happen is. Uh, there to be a negative impact in, in terms of the garment industry, uh, in terms of uh, American workers um, and who are earning uh, livable wages, making uniforms for uh, postal employees. So uh, I, I put it on the table. I'd be interested in your response. Uh, I would like to respond. Uh, at the present time, with the exception of footwear, there is no requirement for a domestic source. Um, the but new, we'd like to have a domestic I, look at I, yeah. the, um, the change that we're going to be making is that there will be a requirement for domestic source for all uniforms under the new arrangement. So we're changing that from no domestic, not a requirement for domestic source to a requirement for domestic source. We now have um, some 200 uniform manufacturers around this country. Um, and the majority of them are non-union manufacturers. Uh, three of our five largest uniform manufacturers are uh, union manufacturers. Our, our idea is to award these contracts on a best value basis and not low bid. Uh, you can get low bid and, and be buying uh, clothes more often but we're going to be going on a low-value basis. I think that, that's what we're, we're planning to do. Well, I won't prolong it, but I'd like to be kept informed as okay. you proceed through this. Uh, I have an, an interest in, and there are people uh, who have been earning a living, uh, sending their children to college, buying postage stamps in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, make it, uh, making these uniforms, and so I have an interest in it. Uh, so if you would keep me informed, I'd appreciate we'll it. Gentlemen, I will do that. I would thank the chairman. Jump here for me. I'd be glad to hear. Just to piggyback on that, do you say that you'll be awarding contracts, or is it going to be one contract? Well, it won't be just one. There'll be a whole I, series of contracts? I can't, I, I don't know. I can't believe it'd be just one, but I'll check on that and, and supply that to you for the record. I thank the gentleman. If I might, so you are going to establish a domestic content requirement so that I, I, I think, I don't, I don't, 
either want to nor do I need to put words in the mouth of either of the two distinguished gentlemen on my right. There are three distinguished gentlemen, but only two of them spoke on this issue. <laughs> but I think a big concern is that we've heard a lot in the news about forced labor, child labor, sweatshops, all of it offshore, that uh, would be very, very troubling to any of us to know that the Postal Service were requiring uniforms from that kind of source. Mm -hmm. Not the least of which is to say that the United States Postal Service would look a heck of a lot better than many of us in Made in America uniforms. And, 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 uh, I think that's a pretty idea, but you're not going to be buying offshore for the first time. You're going to have a domestic content requirement. That's right. Well, that's that's a good start. I think we'd all agree with that. But as with the ranking member, I too would appreciate being okay. kept advised as this goes forward. We'll uh, with that, uh, I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latrat. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Postmaster General. I, I want to begin with uh, some praise today, uh, and then we'll get into some issues that uh, that concern me and. The time will only permit me to talk about two of those um, today, but, but where I'm from in the Cleveland Regional Office, you've put a fellow by the name of Don Peterson in charge, and I want to tell you he's been very, very responsible uh, and responsive to the concerns of uh, the folks where I'm from, and I appreciate that very much, and I think when somebody does a good job, they should get mentioned, and I wanted to mention that to you. And I think he's from, originally he was posted in Tennessee or Kentucky, if I remember correctly, and he's, he's come up to the North, as we say, and he's done a fine job of getting along with all us Northerners, and I appreciate that very, very much. The, the two issues that I, that I want to talk about, I mentioned in my opening remarks, and I was also talking to Mr. Motley about, and it, the tension that I hear from uh, my constituents is, the, uh, is the Postal Service going to the postal business? Uh, and and uh, it again relates to the net income figure, it relates to service as opposed to turning a profit. It relates to, I think, some of the uh, labor management uh, items that are under discussion. And I, I just want to throw up uh, two things for your, your comment and observation, if you would. And one is one that I directly asked Mr. Motley. I receive a, a lot of mail and uh, uh, a lot of uh, correspondence from, from people who pay attention to postal issues in my district. And they, they read the article and, and say, I think it's swell that the Postal Service is a net income of $1.6 million. And, um, is making money, if you want to look at it, and, and I think it is making money. They then read uh, the articles about uh, supervisors and others in the hierarchy of the Postal Service receiving uh, tens of thousands of dollars in bonuses towards the end of uh, last year. Uh, and they then read the articles about the, the fact, and Mr. Motley touched upon it, that there's been a 76 percent increase uh, in grievance filings in the, in the recent history. Now, some, uh, some skeptics in my district and in Ohio argue that all of those things are, are all related uh, and that, that uh, in order to turn a profit, the squeeze has been put on supervisors and regional directors to uh, come in under budget or to, to turn that profit uh, in order to earn a bonus. And as a result, they put the squeeze on the rank and file postal worker, which has led to the elevation of, of grievances. And I, I was just wondering if you have a, an observation or a thought on that. Uh, as to whether or not those people are just being skeptical, whether there is some interrelation, uh, or what, what your thoughts are. First, I'd like to, to point out that in, in becoming more businesslike, the first thing that we've told all our employees is treat the customer like a customer, provide better service. Service is what our business is. <clears throat> our service has improved. And any time I talk about the fact that we made some money last year. I also talk about the fact our quality improved last year. Uh, over the past uh, three years, our quality has improved uh, about nine points. So that we're at 91 percent now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, probably this quarter will be higher than that uh, because we're working at that. And that's the most important thing. Now, one of the things in the Postal Service when I came here I was told that we can do service or we can do cost, but we can't do both. So which one do you want? Mm -hmm. And so I said, I want service, and cost went west. And I said, well, now, you've got to have some cost, service goes west. We now realize that service and cost go hand in hand. When you eliminate problems, 
the cost gets better. When you don't have to repair something and you only do the right thing right the first time, you don't have to do it the second and third time, it costs less. True. So you can do service and you can do profits at the same time. And that's what we're doing. So uh, those people, let's say, we don't pay any attention to service, I don't believe that. We okay. are paying attention to service uh, because that's if one of the things, the only thing, only way a person can get that bonus that you're talking about, and I'll speak to that in a minute, is to make the service targets. If they don't make the service targets, they don't get the bonus. Well, I guess that was the point, that, that the, the bonuses are tied to service improvement and not cost containment or cost uh, elimination. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Both. Okay. Uh, the uh, economic value added uh, system that we have has uh, three areas in it. One is the revenue, uh, one is service, and one is employees. And we put employees in there because we recognize that when you say to somebody, you need to make this money, they might do it on the backs of employees. Right. So we put some measurements in there on employees mm -hmm. to see if we could you know, control that. Because if they're, if they're beating up employees right. to make the money or get the service, that's not the way we want to run the business. And so they get graded on all three, and they only get the bonus on that basis. Are, are they all, when you say, and, and I'm glad to hear that, because that answers exactly the question that I get from back home, are, are they all three equally weighted? Yes, a third, one third. A third a third? Third, a third, a third. And, and if the chairman, if I can beg his indulgence, just the second part of that goes to the, the very existence of post offices and postal service, and in particular, I'm, I'm referencing page four, your testimony that you submitted about how you have to leverage your, your many postal outlets in the country. For many small towns, and I don't have the privilege of, of being from a big city like Mr. Fatah, Philadelphia, we have 89 communities in my congressional district. The post office often is the, the heart and soul. It's the identifying. It's on the town square, and it's been there for as long as anybody can remember. Um, and, and that, again, brings up the question of service versus business. Uh, when you make your closing decisions, is the fact that it, it's an identifiable part of the fabric of that community the window and you're having to pay so much money to uh, to keep the postal clerk behind the window yes the the fact that it may not be an economic post office has nothing to do with it we have uh, probably I don't know the exact number but I'll provide it for the record we have several thousands of post offices where we spend four dollars in cost to make one dollar in revenue it might be those 89 you're talking about, if they're as small as you say, fall in that category. Mm -hmm. But the law uh, that set up the U.S. Postal Service says you cannot close down a post office for economic reasons. I mean, it's in the law. So the first thing we can't do is, is violate the law. So that can't happen. I'd like to get back to the, the outlandish bonuses or however you use that word. Oh, I didn't uh, say outlandish. I said they were large. Large. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Coughlin here, who makes $148,000 as a uh, deputy postmaster general, got a $400 bonus. It's not because he didn't do his job. It's because he can't make more money than that. Uh, we had uh, several officers who uh, did not get their entire bonus. Um, I think that it's very appropriate when... Uh, you make $1.6 billion better than what the plan was. To spend $169 million is how much was spent on bonuses that year. And uh, I, I think it's an appropriate number. I don't think it was, uh, uh, I don't think it was even large. Yeah, and, and j just so I'm not misunderstood, I, I didn't say it was inappropriate. What I, what I suggested was if, if bonuses were given uh, based upon cost reduction only or on the backs of the working oh, force. Okay. I thought that was inappropriate and outlandish, but right. uh, I, would agree I, was questioning, I was questioning how that came about, and you've answered yeah. that, and I appreciate yes. that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, well, I think the gentleman raised the point. You might want to read uh, Chapter 37 of Title 10 of H.R. 22, where we set up a structure to provide bonuses for all employees, which I believe the Postmaster General supports. And that may uh, 
help address, but it's a very legitimate uh, question, very legitimate concern. Uh, we, we have a vote, and I would propose that we suspend this hearing while we go vote and try okay. to return as quickly as we can. If uh, you could uh, bear with us, please, gentlemen. We'll be okay. back. Uh, we'll stand in recess. I thank uh, for the sense of expediency. Uh, we'll continue. I know the other members, uh, some of them had to go on to other meetings and won't be able to return, and others uh, are on their way. But I know your time is valuable, Mr. Postmaster General, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I I'd like to uh, talk a minute about uh, your revenues. And um, I made the comment last week as uh, I was reading the economist's testimony that I was continuously reminded why I didn't become an economist. Uh, basically because I didn't have the uh, analytical ability. And, I, and I'm truly trying to understand your budget. And I, I don't mean to be either flippant or facetious. But as I understand from your testimony, you, let's start at the end. You expect to end this year with a $55 million surplus. That was our budget. We expect to end it about $500 million. Surplus? Yes, sir. Okay, well, that answers the question. Because I was walking through the figures, and based upon what you had told me, your... Um, Revenues are through March. Your net income is 1.1 billion, which was 243 million dollars over budget, over your plan. Mm. As you were approaching yeah, the slow I, I season, guess that's right. yeah, yeah, but we got a slow season coming. How out. slow it could be to go from 243 to a, only a net of plus 55. So you're saying now it's about 500 billion. Mm -hmm. it's, it, by the way, the forecast is something like million, a little actually. in excess of uh, 200 million. A period for about four periods, which would be 800 loss. million billion loss. That's a slow season. It gets uh, I'm sorry. Would you repeat that? Uh, you said we're going into the slow season, and we well, are. As I understand it, you are. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And, and the way the revenues come in at the postal service is during these months that are coming up, with vacation periods and replacements and and low mail uh, volumes and things of that nature. Uh, we have losses, and our projected losses, uh, and I'll, I'll provide these to you for the record, but it's something like uh, $200 million on average. That's just a round number, but that's $800 million. From the 1-1 from the one -one would be $300 million. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm saying that we think we're going to be able to not lose that much and uh, end up with uh, $500 million. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's an important change. Mm -hmm. How does that affect, when, when, did, when did this change in your estimate occur? I mean, that's pretty recent. Well, of course, it changes almost every right. month as you, you get what you've got. Uh, I, I guess what you're, you're thinking about is, why are we going to lose some money next year? Um, I'm considering that. I'm also wondering to what extent this new information may or may not have an effect on the deliberations that you mentioned in your opening statement mm -hmm. the Board of Governors are currently going through with respect to a rate increase. Right. Um, the, the facts are that about a year ago, we expected we were going to lose about $2.2 .2 billion last year. Uh, then we went to work to see what we can do to increase revenues and lower costs. Uh, by the time uh, it was necessary to submit our budget uh, to the president. Uh, we had that down to 1.8 billion, and that's what we submitted to the president. At this time, uh, we're at about uh, 1.4 billion loss next year. And we're looking for ways to offset that, and we haven't got much time to find them. And that's why we, you know, we got the 60 to 90 day period there that the, the board was talking about. Um, if we can't find them, we've got a real problem. It means running a loss. We don't want to run a loss. Uh, we should not be running a loss. Uh, 
And if it turns out that way, then we've got a problem we have to deal with. Do we run a loss that year or do we change uh, price of mail? What, uh, assuming the $500 million <laughs> holds, well, uh, let me ask two questions based on that. That's a $450 million adjustment in your projection, mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, <coughs> what was the major cause of such a change? I mean, your volumes are down, your revenues are, are up over projections. What, what is the dynamic at work here that produces, at least for the moment, what looks like a $450 million plus on your net revenues from your plan? Our volumes actually have all of a sudden started increasing. <coughs> Well, of course, Which they always increase. They weren't increasing as much as you thought they should. Yep. Now they're increasing more than you thought they would. Uh, let, me, let me try to add to this. Um, the, um, the, the latest accounting period, which I think was eight, we had a, all of a sudden a strong surge in first-class mail. And in fact, I think we actually got about $200 million better than the plan in, in this accounting period eight. That's part of this sudden resurgence of, of revenue, which we'll have to see whether it holds. Um, uh, as part of it. There were also some adjustments that were made, some accounting adjustments that were clear that we uh, were able to make that amounted to a couple of hundred million dollars um, in, the, in the process. Uh, and the fact is that expenses are running almost $400 million better than planned. Uh, we've been able to hold, hold those back uh, and offset uh, some of the revenue shortfall. We still do have a small revenue shortfall uh, against our plan, but it's, it's primarily on the expense side that this is occurring. Uh, I'm confused. How can you have a shortfall on your on your revenues if your plan just went from an expected $55 million net income to four to $500 million? Well, there's, two, there's just two sides of the ledger, uh, and we're doing much better on the expense side than we ex had expected, and we're not doing quite as quite up to the original plan uh, at this point. Now we could could exceed it before the end of the year. Our our projection does not anticipate it. But it's primarily on the cost side. It's almost exclusively on the cost side where we're doing, doing better. So we haven't seen a great change in, in what you're handling and the kinds of business, uh, business you've been doing. Well, it's, 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 it's a little hard to see. The volume is actually up this year so far 3.2%. That's a marked change from what we've been experiencing uh, over the last few years and certainly over the last couple of years. Uh, now, some of that is the result of uh, the um, um, Thank you. is the result of uh, the reclassification last year. It's had a, it's had a, it's it's encouraged more of, of certain kinds of volume. It's also changed the revenue per piece, the mix of how much revenue we're getting per piece. Uh, at the same time, though, it's helping the system in terms of its efficiency, because, and that was the purpose of reclassification to make the mail stream more efficient. Okay. Let me, let me finish the second part of the question, then I yield to uh, my colleague from Illinois. Uh, the next logical question, or at least in my mind, is if you now have $500 million rather than 55, what are you going to do with that $500 million? We'll use that for capital instead of uh, uh, having to borrow money. I'm sorry, instead of... Having to borrow for our capital spending. Well, I think I could probably go through the audience and find a lot of people who say, you know, what you ought to do that revenue is forestall a rate increase to the greatest extent possible. There's a, no surprise to you, there's a real philosophical argument amongst the mailing community. Where does your first responsibility lie? To retire your outstanding debt or to keep your rates as low as possible and keep the system as affordable? So... You now have $450 million. You may have $450 million more than you thought. Are you going to use it to retire your debt, or are you going to use it to, uh, to hold down rates? Well, when you say hold down rates, uh, $500 million would be worth about a third of a cent. Um, and depending on what our need is, a third of a cent might do it. But, you know, unless we get much better than where we are right now, we're looking for more than a third of a cent. Mm -hmm. The 500 million, Mr. Chairman, will become part of the asset base of the Postal Service at the end of this year, assuming that's what we make. It'll be part of the equity asset base of this organization. It could be in the form of cash. It could be in the form of, of, um, of additional physical assets of some kind in the system. 
Um, that's, that's really what equity is in this situation. Debt, on the other hand, our debt totals something like $5 billion. Uh, all of it at the present time is placed with the uh, Federal Financing Bank, and there's a schedule for repayment of it. Uh, I don't recall offhand whether any of it just it calls for repayment this year. There's probably small pieces of it, but it is two different things we're talking about here. And I know it, I know it's a confusing subject to, to Well, no, I understand it. I mean, you've, you've got an agreement whereby or a plan by where you're going to retire debt in, in a set number of years, and to do that, you've got to put certain amount of cash toward the debt retirement. The question becomes if you, and your plan provided for whatever your your next year's requirement out of this, the end of this year, fiscal year's uh, budget was. If you got $450 million more than you thought you did, you've got more than your plan called for to do something. And it's either you're going to put it against debt or you're going to put it toward something else. And a third of a cent, I, I agree, is not uh, up to where you need. But I mean, it's not chump change either. Absolutely. So you're not going to tell me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what we didn't tell you, Mr. Chairman. I, was <laughs> I think you know exactly what you didn't tell me. <laughs> I'd be happy to yield to, I believe, Mr. Davis is... Uh, Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Chairman. With that chump change terminology, you sound like you may have been to Chicago. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me thank you very much and uh, certainly want to... Thank you, Mr. Postmaster General, for being here with us this afternoon. And I would certainly concur with parts of your statement and others who have indicated that you've certainly made a lot of progress in the last two years. And uh, I don't think that you have an awful lot to be ashamed of, but there is always, as we all know, room for improvement. And there is always an effort to move beyond where we are. I think most of us would agree that two of the challenges facing the service and facing the system is, is how do we improve management, labor relations, while at the same time control cost. Uh, my question is, do you view that as, as an inherent uh, thorny area of difficulty, or, or do you view it as, as something that can really be, be that, that can really be accomplished without the idea of winners and losers. It will only be accomplished if we don't have winners and losers. Uh, that's that's the big problem in, in management labor relations in any business that you're in. If you're going to have winners and looter, losers, it's not going to work. You've got to have winners and winners, and uh, we have to get more into that arena of working with each other to accomplish that. And uh, we're working with the conciliation board at the present time with the heads of the unions to, to try to accomplish that. Uh, they've outlined five things that they thought, let me uh, tell you a little bit about how they went about doing this. <clears throat> the conciliation board went around and talked to several people in each of the unions and the management associations and found out what they felt their problems were. Then they put all those problems together, and they came to the Postal Service. They put all those problems together and came up with uh, five things they thought we ought to be working on. And um, I can't repeat that at this moment, but I'll give you a copy of what those five things they thought we should be working on together. Uh, we have set up work groups on three of those things. Uh, we haven't reached agreement yet, to agree to work on all of them. I'd like to work on all of them. I would, I think we should. But we haven't reached agreement to do that yet. We need to reach agreement to work on those and then reach agreement to come up with solutions. Now, one of the things that we have agreed upon to work on is on the uh, grievances. And we're working very hard at that, trying to change the way we handle grievances and, and try to get that out of a win-lose situation. Um, so that, that's what's going on. So three out of five in terms of a beginning, a start, mm -hmm. certainly is, is not anything to scoff at. And so right. you're making progress yes, sir. In, in that direction. I also have some concerns about the, the whole question of the uniforms and, and the manufacturing of those and how we acquire them and where we acquire them. But 
I don't necessarily want to belabor that point. I would just associate myself with the remarks and comments of the gentleman from Pennsylvania and uh, let it suffice at that. That, that. that is an area of concern that we certainly have some real reservations about in terms of what I'm hearing and the way at least some of the manufacturers feel and, and, and some of the unions and, and some of the workers feel that it's headed. And so we'll leave it at that. The other question that I, that I have is, in terms of affirmative action, and when I talk of affirmative action, I'm really just simply talking about a playing field that, that kind of levels itself out and give small businesses, gives women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, an opportunity to play in the big arena. Could you share with us what, what the Postal Service's position is relative to I'd that? I'd like Mr. Coughlin to uh, answer that if we could. Uh, yes, Mr. Davis. <clears throat> uh, when when uh, Mr. Runyon became the Postmaster General in 1992, he put together, he, he broadened the whole effort in this area from what had been largely complaint processing and affirmative action to the diversity effort, which still incorporates or, or includes both of those elements, but goes beyond that. Emphasis in four, four broad areas. Uh, one is the whole outreach effort to get more minorities and women involved in, in contracting uh, as suppliers and potential suppliers of the Postal Service. The second is this whole area of training and development for supervisory employees. Uh, to, uh, to uh, the third is the is the is the idea of creating opportunities for for job growth and development for all employees at, at all levels, and most recently there's been a considerable special emphasis on uh, on the whole problem of sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, with a considerable amount of attention and effort in that area. Uh, I think uh, we've had some success in the uh, in the whole area of uh, of uh, Involving more minorities and women in, in contracting, I can pl uh, com can supply the, the detailed statistics for you uh, in our most recent years here, if uh, if that'll help you uh, in that regard. Well, I certainly appreciate that because I know that there are serious efforts in many quarters and in many places to take the position that there is not the need for this kind of activity that we have reached a sufficient level, and I'm not one who agrees with that. And I certainly want to commend you for recognizing what I consider to be one of the great needs that still exist in, in, in our country. And I commend you for it, and I would certainly want to see the absolute numbers, and, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I uh, have to yield to the uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Owens. Yes, I, I too don't want to be redundant, uh, but on the uniforms, I hope you will have more than one source and consider having a source from each uh, region of the country. Uh, there's a lot of uniforms to be made and I think that the value of the uniform as a piece of cloth can be enhanced in terms of the value in terms of producing some jobs uh, in these uh, various areas and I applaud your commitment to a Buy America uh, policy. On the question of training, I hate to keep bringing up the subject but I just refuse to uh, accept that uh, there are available materials of a superior quality and I can't get my hands on them so I want to go back to that and, and ask uh, can you make available a copy of your training system uh, how it works and, and the whole setup and, and some examples of uh, what you use for training in terms of videos or film or uh, whatever uh, because I have not been able to get my hands on very much in two years. Mr. Owens, that uh, it kind of amazes me because I must get two or three videos a week on my desk to look at that are part of our training system. I'll make sure you get more videos than you'll probably ever want to look at, but <laughs> as, well as, a, as well as a clear description of our training. Room 2305 in this building. Okay, we'll I get it I appreciate that, and I won't bother you with the subject anymore. The more Difficult subject, however, is the matter of revenue, service, and employees that you talked about. Revenue targets versus service targets, and I applaud the provision in the law which says that no post office should ever be closed down on the basis of revenue. I applaud the nobility of spending $4 for $1 worth of revenue, if that has to be the case, to provide postal service in certain parts of America. My problem is that my constituents think that uh, it's gone to the extreme in terms of they are subsidizing somebody somewhere. Uh, we have two and a half million people in Brooklyn. 
two and a half million people is large enough to have a first class postal operation. Uh, and first of all, we have a structure which I've talked to Postmaster General about. Uh, he's, you have been kind enough to come to my office and talk about this, so I'm not going to go into the same kind of detail. But uh, the feeling is that there is a tremendous profit being made in this, you know, the area where the, the density of the population is great. The number of people who are immigrants is great. They're sending mail all over the place. And, and yet our service is inferior. Uh, you know, it goes around, it comes around. I've certainly tried with your postal employees at the local area level to work closer with them. And they're very nice people generally, the managers. I have no complaint about their attitude. Uh, they've gone to town meetings with me and <laughs> talked about the problems to, to my constituents so much that in the last election, one of my opponents accused me of having sold out to the post office and trying to whitewash the post office. Uh, so, you know, people feel very strongly about it, and their experiences are, you know, frequent uh, with the post office. So let's see if we can get to the, the, the bottom of, you know, Brooklyn service ought to be first class service because, after all, there are enough people there to pay for it. Uh, you talked, uh, when I spoke to you earlier at my office, Mr. Postmaster General, you said you would check to see if you have profit centers and you can tell me, you know, the revenue situation in Brooklyn versus the, the intake versus the outgo. And, and, and I wondered if you had a chance to deal with that and you have those figures. You know. I don't have the figures today, no, sir. We will give you those but figures. But it is possible to get uh, it by region, by area, I, by... I'm, I'm looking now to see. We do not have um, revenue by area. It's very difficult to do. You see, what can happen is that we have some parts of the country where there are big mailers, uh, big printers, they print up a lot of material and they uh, mail it. And the way they mail it is they take it to a BMC, which is a large area, and they, they give it to them. They send it to, to places like Brooklyn. They deliver the mail. The revenue for that stays where it is. Now we're trying to figure out how to reallocate that revenue. It's very difficult to do. So we're trying to figure that out, how we reallocate that revenue so that we can have people have revenue goals. Because it's very important to me for people to have revenue goals. If they don't have revenue goals, how am I going to measure their performance? So we're trying to figure that out. But uh, I, I don't think so I can... you have some glitches here and there, but you can tell people send a lot of parcels in my district. I have, I have 150,000 non-citizens, 582,000 people in in the uh, congressional district and 150,000 non-citizens who have relatives in West yeah. Indians and very, uh, West Indians and very other places. And they're sending parcels all the time. So I suppose you can figure out how much the revenue for parcel sending is from well, the source. Uh, and you could break it down to certain, you, could, you can indicate how much flows out of it, it might be possible. Post offices. Yeah, it might be possible to find out the total amount of revenue that you have in that area and also the total amount of expense. My guess is that the total, and this is only guess, uh, is that the expense would be more than the revenue. But we need to find that out. And I can find that out. I, I can't tell you I how I don't know to why you have to guess, Mr. Mr. Postmaster General. When you just said you have some post office in the United States where you're spending $4 for a dollar's worth of, with $1 worth of revenue, you're actually spending $4. So you know that from some sources. Why is it difficult for Brooklyn? Well, I can, I can probably go and study every one of those post offices in Brooklyn and tell you that. I'm not, you can probably go. You already have, you have the data on no, the we others. Why don't you have the data on these? No, no, we you have data on the small ones that are subsidized. Why don't you have data on all of them? I mean, we don't have data on 38,000 post offices on what they're doing. We are right now starting a system uh, for incentive pay by trying a new system in each post office. And we, I think we've got three post offices that are running this test so that they run as, a, as if they were an individual business. And we measure their revenue and their expense to see if we can actually measure a post office that way. So, so that, that we're doing. And well, we're, I don't think that, that's hard. I don't think you take a, need a rocket science to do, scientist to do that. And you just made a very strong statement that you probably will find that the expenses are greater than the revenue. You just made a strong statement there. I challenge that statement. I say it's that's probably right. that the revenue is greater than expenses. So. How well, many days will it take for us to prove who's right or who's wrong? Can I get a commitment to have some kind of data? Yeah, uh, I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll give you some data in response to that, yes, sir. Uh, you're asking me when. I'm not a, I don't do the numbers myself. I need to have some financial people tell me, but I will tell you uh, in two days how soon you can have it.
Thank you. I've been in this position for 15 years. Post office has been an issue for all those 15 years. I've tried very hard to cooperate, and I will continue to try to cooperate, but I think I need to be able to give some hard answers to the people who ask those hard questions in my district. I talked about the fact that we have an ongoing problem with the del delivery of mail, and we found out at one point that you had a large number of casuals. Casuals are people who paid half as much as the regular carriers. They have no friends benefits, so they must make revenue, I mean, the, 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 the cost uh, go down when you have lots of casuals uh, versus regular uh, carriers. And uh, the service, of course, goes down also because they really don't know what they're doing. They don't really care. Uh, and we've talked about that. And they insist that they have a large number of casuals. When I talked to you, you had a figure which said uh, about 5%, uh, you know. Uh, but the people out there in my district say that they don't have regular mailmen the way they did 20 years ago. They don't have it, and they still don't have it, even after I was promised that the casuals would be phased out completely. Uh, you know, 5% is still casuals, but they don't think it's 5%. They think it's much higher. And I get these complaints over and over again. It goes round and round. We think we've solved the problem, and then it comes back. And I told you, I think there's a management problem there in terms of Brooklyn has 2.5 million people, and yet in your management structure, it was subsumed under a system which, and combined with Queens, which has fewer people, and the people in Brooklyn have to travel to Queens to get an application for a postal job or to get an interview, and there's something wrong with the structure which treats a, a place with two and a half million people, which is, would be the fifth or sixth largest city in the United States if it was a city unto itself, as if it was you know, just a, a unit of something else. So I won't go into all that again. I just would like to have a response that gives me something to go back to my constituents with uh, that, that I can you can say it's concrete and, and we can have a dialogue which is a reasonable dialogue. Otherwise, you've got a revolution coming in, in Brooklyn demanding that our post office give us a whole new shake up there. Thank you. Mr. Owens, as a, a result of uh, my visit to your office, I, I contacted Mr. Solomon who is uh, acting in, in that area of capacity there. Uh, he uh, is trying to make an appointment with you to see you and, and come to your office and tell you the answer to some of those questions that you've asked. I look so, forward to that. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Think how tough he'd be if he didn't roll over like his opponent said. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Think how tough he'd be if he didn't roll over like your opponent said. <laughs> uh, we're, we've run quite a while here, almost three hours, and, and we all have uh, other engagements, I know. I, I wanted to just two quick points. I hope they're quick. Uh, I know you heard Mr. Motley and my exchange, my exchange with respect to the GPRA and the need to have a draft document sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the GAO makes very cogent uh, observations when they point out the possibilities that this process can bring toward healing all kinds of, of scars and wounds, uh, not the least of which is at least putting us down the right path on some man management labor issues. So uh, I would only urge you to get that document out and available to, to uh, the, uh, the public and to your constituent groups as quickly as you can. And um, secondly, uh, a question I asked the uh, Board of Governors, I'll ask you, what's the status on Pack and Send? The status on Pack and Send is that uh, we did have it in 260 locations. PRC ruled that that was a postal-related product and should come before them for pricing. Uh, we, as a result of that, uh, immediately stopped the pack-and-send operation. Uh, we're now studying uh, the pack-and-send operation uh, to determine uh, what we need to go back to our board with. So a decision hasn't been reached, but it will be reached uh, in the next couple of months uh, that we'll take to the board. The decision either to go forward with to it. To go far, if we go forward, we have to not. go to the postal rate commission with a rate case, and and we're looking at that. Okay, uh, Mr. Fatah, any final thoughts, comments, questions? No, I think it's been enough for one. Day. Okay, All right. well, I thank you <laughs> for being here as always, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. We appreciate your being here. As I noted, Mr. Motley, we'd appreciate uh, the opportunity to file some uh, questions several of which have to do with the great uh, state of New York and the 24th Congressional District problem we're having, uh, <laughs> others, and uh, we look forward to your responses. And with that, uh, the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Beginning next month, C-SPAN retraces the steps of Alexis de Tocqueville, author of Democracy in America. We begin with a preview, live from France, tomorrow morning.